so I'm glad. Okay, and my pen works too. Oh, this is wonderful. Okay. Um, so we so are ready. Okay, so go ahead. Pa okay, so this is Paulus Motakis. I assume everybody knows him. Uh, so one little change from last year is that he's now in, uh, at York University in Toronto. He, uh, he got a permanent position there, so congrats for that. And he's speaking on Capital L1 of Capital LP being primary. Paulus? Uh, th thank you very much, Bunyamin, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I also think I'm the first person to give two lectures in this webinar. Am I right? Okay, yes, thanks. Uh, so this is my second lecture since last year. For so the third one, we are charging. Just let okay, you. so so no more lectures from me then. Uh, no, so the third one has to, he has to take over from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even worse, I'd rather pay. So we're talking about primariness of the Banach space L1 of LP. So this is a classical property of Banach spaces. There have been a dozen papers published on it. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to be able to present to you this lecture about this property for this very classical space. Uh, so let me just start off by saying that this is a joint work with Richard Lechner, Paul Müller, and Thomas Schlumprecht. Um, and so this, this result, I mean, although it is very easy to state, it's a very short statement, the proof requires uh, many steps and different tools, and I wouldn't be able to communicate everything effectively in a one-hour lecture. So the purpose would be um, to give some uh, introduction to the history of the problem, to the techniques and the methods and how they originally involved and how um, the, some recent insight has given some, uh, some help as to how some of these old problems can be solved more easily, which eventually led to the possibility of solving this, this problem uh, today. So then I've broken up the lecture into three parts. First is the background, then is the methods, originally how they evolved, some recent insights, and then I will give you some uh, information as, uh, about the steps of how, how we did this um, nowadays. So let's start with the background. Um, so I want to, to give uh, the definitions of uh, that we're going to use even for defining primary. So we have a Banach space X and we have a subspace of it, Y. And then what does it mean that the space Y is complemented in X? It means that X can be written as a direct sum of Y together with another subspace Z that is inside X. So this is a complement, it's a direct sum to topological sums, the spaces Y and Z, they have zero intersection and they are closed and their sum gives you the whole space. And the notation that I will use throughout this lecture is that uh, Y is a complemented subsets of X will be denoted with this hook. Um, so one of the early results involving this, this, this definition of a complemented subspace is a famous result by uh, Perczynski who proved that if you take X to be either C0 or a little LP, then any of its complemented subspaces, as long as it's not finite dimensional, has to be isomorphic to the whole space. Uh, and this is also where he used his uh, famous Perczynski decomposition method, the accordion lemma. Uh, and based on this, on this result, we, well, it was later introduced and we'll talk about that, we, but we now this call a space X prime prime, whenever it has this property, uh, all of its infinite dimensional complemented subspaces have to be isomorphic to the space. And a little bit later, Linden Strauss also proved that L infinity is prime. So at this point, we know that all the classical sequence spaces, all the little LPs and um, C0 have this property of being prime. Um, but the prime, being prime is a very rare property indeed. And if you go to a slightly more complicated, very classical spaces. For example, if you go to function spaces, they are no longer prime. So if you look at C01, the space of functions or uh, of continuous functions, or you look at the spaces of measurable functions, the Lebesgue spaces, uh, these are no longer prime spaces because they contain inside them as complemented subspaces, the corresponding sequence spaces. For example, C01 contains C0 and capital P contains little p as complemented subspaces. However, uh, these spaces, do have some property which is similar. Uh, so it was first, it was first Linden Strauss and Pelczynski who proved in 1971 that if we take the space C01, the space of continuous functions, if one decomposes it into two complemented subspaces, if we write as a topological sum of Y and Z, where Z and Y are subspaces of X, then one of the two has to be isomorphic to the whole space. And any Banach space X with this property, whenever you decompose it into two pieces, one of them has to be isomorphic to the whole space, then we will say that this space um, 
is primary. Mm. So let's see. So uh, soon after this paper, Lyndon Strauss, he, ah, uh, okay. I just realized I've opened the wrong version of the paper. I have to go back now because I see there are no bullets. Okay, I apologize for this. And I'm going to fix this very quickly. Uh, just give me one second. I will unshare my screen for a second. And Well, technical issue. It won't be more than, uh, I don't know, like 15 more seconds, I hope. Do you want me to play a commercial? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think you should be able to see it. Is that right? Yes, it's good. Okay, good. So as you can see, there's a slight difference. Before you could see everything that was uh, on my on the slide and not only the first part, but I wanted to only show you the first part. So this would have been a bit disappointing. There would be no suspense. So Lyndon Strauss introduced in 1971 um, the, the program of studying what infinite dimensional Banach spaces X cannot be decomposed, cannot, into two pieces Y and Z complemented so that both of them are infinite dimensional and neither of them is isomorphic to the space X. And if you think about it, it's sort of a natural question. Whenever can you decompose in a Banach space that's, well, it has to be infinite, infinite dimensional, it's two pieces that truly don't look like the space, neither of them looks like the space. And he published a paper in 1971 where they basically, he basically only asked questions about this specific topic. And he didn't word it exactly like this, but I will tell you how he worded it. And you will agree that this is basically the same wording. So uh, he asked, the first problem that he asked was find in decomposable Banach spaces, i.e. spaces all of whose decompositions fail A, so you cannot decompose it into two pieces uh, so that both of them are infinite dimensional. This is impossible. And um, this is um, a very important class of Banach spaces. By the time it was completely unknown whether they existed. And the first example of such a space was the gauss moray space in 1993. And uh, such spaces have played a, a very important role in the modern direction of Banach space theory. Uh, for example, the argyros hayden space is also such a space that solved the scalar plus compact problem. Um, and the second problem that he posed is determine the primary spaces. So these are the spaces, all of whose decompositions fail B. So whenever you are able to break it into two infinite dimensional pieces, then at least one of them has to be isomorphic to the whole space X. So he posed these two problems and you will agree that more or less stating problem one and problem two is the same as asking the question we wrote above. Um, and to make another comment is that, okay, we said that in decomposable spaces are hugely important in Banach space theory. However, if you look at the classical Banach spaces, for example, C01, capital P, and so on and so forth, they're all decomposable. And you can find complemented subspace by taking restriction operators, conditional expectations, so by doing very natural things. So problem two actually came with an additional part. So this was included in his question. So in particular, he asked to determine the separable classical primary spaces. Um, and of course, it's open up to interpretation what the classical space is. Uh, but this program motivated um, a large number of researchers and a great deal of papers have been written in this, in this topic of decompositions of, of Banach spaces. Um, 
So nextly, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, various results that were proved based on this program of Linden Strauss. Um, so this is the list with um, the what Linden Strauss himself called the main classical spaces in this paper. So C01, which himself, Linden Strauss and Polchinski, as we already mentioned, they proved is a primary space. And then there were all the C of K spaces for K um, countable. So this is also primary proved by the yard in 75. And this now covers all uh, compact metric spaces for all compact metric spaces. C of K is going to be primary by Milutin's theorem. And then a little bit later, uh, Enflo and Moray proved that capital LP in the separable range is primary. In, in the case P is infinity is prime, of course, by, um, by Linden Strauss result. Uh, and a little bit later, capital P for P in the reflexive range was again proved to be primary. And let me just say that um, uh, a few comments about these two papers. So the first paper, which is by Enflo and Moray, uh, it was actually written by Moray. It was authored by Moray, this paper, but he attributes uh, the, the method to Enflo. And Moray published it with Enflo's permission. And the, the second paper, which came a little bit later, the result is covered, of course, by the previous paper. But in the reflexive range, uh, Alsbach, Enflo, and Odell observed that the method is actually simpler. Uh, and what makes this method simpler is not the reflexivity of the space, it's actually the unconditionality of the Haar system in the, ref in, 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 in the reflexive range. And I will come back to this later. These two methods here, uh, the Enflamore and the Alsbach Enflamore effort, uh, and methods are actually very relative to this lecture. Uh, and I'll, I also want to mention the Enflo Starbird paper of 1979, a very famous and very influential and very deep paper, uh, where, among other things, they can also deduce primarity of capital one, and the methods are quite different from the previous two methods. Uh, and this is a very deep study of all bounded linear operators on capital L1, and it's more related to the study of complemented subspaces. But as a consequence, the very deep methods also yields primarity of capital L1. So let me also, now I want to make a point actually that primarity or primariness is something that uh, has been studied extensively. So let me just briefly go through a list of, of, paces, of spaces that have been proved to be primary by a great, great deal of authors. For example, Bourguin proved in 1983 that H infinity, the space of bounded analytic functions, is primary, uh, or that little lp of x, uh, with X having a symmetric basis was proved by Casaza, Kotman, and Lin to be primary. For example, little LP of little LQ is a primary space. Uh, little LP of big LQ for P in the reflexive range and Q, excuse me, P in the separable range and Q in the reflexive range was proved to be primary by Capone in 79. An infinity of LQ was in 2007. Uh, by work for Q in the reflexive range. Uh, a somewhat interesting result is this quotient space L infinity over C0, very interesting space. Uh, it was proved by Dronowski and Roberts that under the continuum hypothesis, uh, this is a primary space. Uh, something that I find interesting is that uh, in, in 2014, uh, Christina Brech and Piotr Kosmiter observed that this result, they, although they, did, they don't know if it's consistent with ZFC, they were able to show that the method of Dernowski and Roberts does not work in ZFC. So it's still unknown whether this space is primary in ZFC. Uh, in fact, what, they, what Dernowski and Roberts showed is that under continuum hypothesis, this space satisfies Polchinski decomposition. And um, what Brech and uh, Kosmider observed is under the negation of continuum hypothesis and perhaps some other set theoretic uh, uh, conditions, then it does not. So the proof doesn't work. Uh, if we go to operator spaces, then the bounded operators on the Hilbert space are primary as proved by Bloor in 1990. And for similar types of spaces, uh, the projective tensor product of LP spaces and some other similar spaces were proved to be primary by Arias and Farmer. So these are all probably arguably classical spaces. And let me also mention that uh, primariness has been proved for a very large number of spaces are perhaps not considered uh, classical or main classical, for example, James space and James tree space by Casas and Andrew. Um, so there are a few more I want to mention, and um, these are particularly relevant to the lecture. And these are the bochner lebec classical spaces. Um, so firstly, 
Capon proved that LP capital LP of capital Q, this is a primary space and both P and Q have to be in the reflexive range. And let me point out here that what is particularly important is unconditionality in this proof. So it is used in an essential manner. I don't claim to understand this proof very well, but to what, how, from how much, from what I understand from it, unconditionality here is, is absolutely essential. Um, and what, what came a little bit later is that LP of X, where X has a symmetric basis, and P here is actually allowed to be one. This is also a primary space. And um, this was proved by Capon. And both of these spaces are of very high complexity. Both, both of these papers are very high complexity. Uh, and as I said, the first one uses essentially unconditionality. And for the second approach, I would like to say that this is a very sophisticated and very deep paper. And it uses, uh, many different uh, tools and instruments, and it is centered around, let me underline this, centered around the Enflamore approach. Uh, and I will get, I will, I will make a comment on this slightly later. Um, so, so at this point, the, um, as far as bochner lebec spaces uh, are, are concerned, the ones that are still open, the main ones, the, the, the most prominent ones are the spaces capital one of capital LP, um, where P equals one or two is covered by some previous results, and the space capital P of capital one. And the result I want to talk to, uh, about today concerns um, the first space. And let me just say that, um, uh, the, 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 the road to this proof was not direct for us. Uh, we were first actually able to, um, to obtain a proof of Capon's second result with, a, I would say, with a substantially different proof and arguably a simpler proof. And this is what actually led us to be able to, to, to reach this conclusion here. Um, so the result is the following. Uh, it was already stated in the title uh, and is very recent. So the paper is not available yet, actually. We have written the paper, but it's still in the polishing stages. And these things take some time. So I hope we will be able to release it uh, soon enough. So the result is that if you take the space capital L1 of capital LP in the separable range, then uh, L1 of LP is primary. And uh, one thing to say about the proof of this result is that we never use reflexivity. We never use unconditionality. So it is entirely um, irrelevant to the proof that um, the Haar system is unconditional or that the space is reflexive. So we can prove something slightly more general. So if you take any rearrangement invariant function space over the interval, the unit interval 0, 1, and this rearrangement, invari rearrangement invariant space is not L infinity, for some reason, for, if you take L infinity, the proof completely collapses. Um, and if you take the subspace of X, which is the closure of the simple functions, uh, then L1 of Y is primary, where Y is the closure of the simple functions. And in many cases, uh, the closure of the simple functions is the whole space, uh, the whole rearrangement invariant function space. For example, it is well known that if you take a separable Orlich space over zero one, uh, then uh, this separability forces that actually the simple functions are, are dense in the whole space. So for example, for any separable Orlich space, we can deduce that L1 uh, of this Orlich space is primary. Okay, so this is as far as the history of results is concerned. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the methods. Um, so when I say methods of proof of primariness, I will first show, say a few things about how it relates to the study of bounded linear operators and factors of bounded linear operators. And then we will see how this particularly works in capital LP and look at the methods of uh, enflo Moray and Alsbach uh, and flo Odell. Uh, and then I also want to justify what I mean when I say that it has to do with the reduction of operators. Um, by this, I mean something very particular. Okay, so let's, let's start. Uh, so what is a factor of an operator? So we have a Banach space X and we have two operators, T and S. Now I say that T is a factor of S if I can write S as a product of operators so that T is one of them. Then I say that T is a factor of S, uh, very reasonable. And this actually is the same as saying that this diagram here commutes. I can go from X to X directly via S or maybe I can like 
go through T. And it is very important here that these operators A and B are both defined on X and not on other spaces. Then if they were defined on other spaces, we would actually not say that. And this is a very relevant uh, definition to, to the notion of primariness because of the following uh, proposition, uh, which says, if you have a bounded linear operator, and this bounded linear operator is a factor of the identity, meaning that the identity can be written as ATB or BTA, then there exists a complemented subspace inside the image of T that is isomorphic to the whole space X. So inside the image of the space of the operator T, I can find a complemented copy of the whole space. And the proof of this is actually very simple. I wrote it down. I don't want you to look at it. I just want to make a point that this is just, it comes down to verifying that these two operators here uh, uh, satisfy this conclusion. So it's a, it's a very simple fact, very simple to prove at least. So given this observation, there exists this very important corollary, um, which, which has been used many times in the past to prove that spaces are primary. And there are also variations of this corollary, but I will present the one that is relevant to us. So we have a Banach space X, and we, has, we assume that it has two properties. First of all is that it has the accordion property. And this means that it's isomorphic to LP sum of itself for some P or C0 sum of itself also works. And the second one that we assume, the second property is that any bounded linear operator on the space, any bounded linear operator on the space has the following property, either the operator itself or the identity minus set operator is a factor of the identity. So if we assume these two properties for any Banach space, the next is primary. And let's take a quick look at the proof. So what we want to do is we want to decompose X into two pieces, say Y direct some Z. And I've been saying Z for a few months now because I moved to Canada, I used to say Z. Um, and, so, and then we take a projection because this is a complement. I can take a projection onto say the left complement Y. Then the identity minus this this projection is a complement is a compl uh, is a projection onto onto the other complement Z. Now from two, because we can take T to be P, either the image of P or the image of identity minus P must contain a subspace X tilde that is isomorphic to the whole space, and complement it. Okay, and then because one of the two complements say Y contains a subspace X that is isomorphic to X by Pelchinsky's decomposition method, which is of course not trivial, but it is nowadays completely standard. If you have a space that satisfies the accordion property, then any subspace that is complemented and contains a further complement that is isomorphic to the space has to be isomorphic to the whole space. Um, so I want, so I, I think I made a connection with primariness. So I explained the connection between primariness and factors of operators. Now I want to talk a little bit what by, to, I want to explain a little bit what I mean when I say reduction of operators. Uh, so we want to be a little bit more specific now. Uh, so this is going to be about reducing a problem to another problem that is simpler, that still yields primariness. Uh, so we start with the Banach space and we have two operators, T and S. And I want to say that T is a projectional factor of S. So this is something slightly stronger. If, as before, S can be written as a product of three operators, B, T, A, where um, T is in the middle. But additionally, I want to assume that B times A is the identity operator. Uh, so I assume something very specific about the two uh, operators that appear on the left and on the right side of the factorization of S. And what this basically means, so one might ask, why, why did you call it a projectional factor? Well, the reason is the following, that is, if you have this property, then um, A uh, from X to X, let's say from X to A to X, this is an isomorphism. And if you take AB from X to AX is a projection. And then what you get is that B is actually um, 
A inverse composed with AB. And it is A inverse is well defined because it, AB goes to the image of A. Um, so what this means is that A on the right is an isomorphic embedding and B on the left is uh, the inverse of A composed with a projection. So this projection comes into play and this is why we call it a projectional factor. And basically what the projectional factor is, is that it, um, it is an operator that be, that, that, um, that uh, captures the behavior of S on a subspace of X that is isomorphic and complemented uh, to the whole space. This is what it is. And let me try to explain how this relates to, uh, to primariness and why this has to do anything with reducing operators. So let's look at the properties of factors. So first, if we just look at regular factors, when I say that T is a factor of S and S is a factor of R, then T is a factor of R. And this is just by composition. Um, so there is this sort of transitivity when it comes to factors. And the same goes for projectional factors. So if T is a projectional factor of S and S is a projectional factor of R, then T is a projectional factor of R. And this is again, just by composition and because uh, somehow the identities cancel out and you still get the identity for these ABs. It's just a matter of checking it. And what is also just a matter of checking and which is not satisfied for factors, but you need projectional factors is this very nice property is that if you assume that T is a projectional factor of S, then the identity minus T is a projectional factor of the identity minus S. And what we can deduce combining these observations is the following. So let me start with an operator T that is defined in the Banach space X. And let's also say, so this is T zero. I also have a sequence of operators, finite sequence T1, Tn. They're all defined on X. And make the following assumption. Each operator in my sequence from T zero to Tn is a projectional factor of the next guy. And only the last guy has the property that either himself, Tn, or the identity minus said operator is a factor of the identity. Then I can pull this back to the first operator and say that either T0 or I minus T0 is a factor of the identity. And the reason is because projectional factorization is a transitive property. So the first guy is a projectional factor of the last guy, if you have this con consecutive projectional factorization. And because projectional factorization has this third property. Okay. Um, so if T0 I minus T0 is a factor of the identity, then if you use the first property for the identity, you can pull it back to the first operator T0. Therefore, if I want to prove that the Banach space X is primary, and I want to show, and I know that, for example, it satisfies Pelchinsky's decomposition method. And I want to show that every bounded linear operator either is a factor of the identity or the identity minus that operator is a factor of the identity. I have this tool of projectional factors of reducing it to simpler and simpler operators. And at the very end, I can arrive at an operator that I understand very well and show for that, that either it or the identity minus it is a factor of the identity. And then I can pull it back to the first operator. And let me say that many authors have done this in a way or another, but as far as I know, at least, or I don't think any of my co-authors know this either. I don't think this has been explicitly like used or stated like that. Um, okay, so let's talk about methods of proof of primariness. Uh, specifically in the LP spaces. So how do we use the tools that we just talked about in the capital LP spaces? So firstly, I want to talk about the Alsbach and Flodel method, the slightly simpler one, uh, which, will, which, which only works in the reflexive range of capital LP. Then I want to briefly mention the Enflow moray method. And then I want to talk some about some observations that we did recently that only work in capital L1, or they work more naturally in capital L1. Uh, so for this, we need to remember the Haar system, and I just drew a nice picture here. So you 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 take the dyadic intervals. So let let i be a dyadic interval, and then here it is. It's between zero and one, and its endpoints are dyadic rational numbers. And um, the Haar function uh, on this dyadic interval is defined to be the function that is one on the first half of the interval and minus one on the second half of the interval. And as of course everybody knows is that if you go in the separable range of peace, then the Haar system together with a constant function with an appropriate enumeration, the former Schauder basis. Um, 
so a notion that's quite uh, important for this type of proofs, and uh, it is also very important for our proof in particular, is the notion of a Haar multiplier. Um, so take an LP space, a separable LP space, um, and a bounded linear operator T. Then we will call this T a Haar multiplier if every Haar function is an eigenvector of T. So each of those Haar functions is mapped to a multiple of itself. Then I say that it's a Haar multiplier. And if you're more familiar with this terminology, it just means that T is a diagonal operator with respect to this basis. Uh, and this is not very important, but for the context of this definition, we could also consider the constant function as a Haar vector, and we actually do, but it doesn't really matter. And a very, very important remark is that if we assume that the Haar system is unconditional, namely if we are in the reflexive range, if we assume unconditionality, then we understand very, very well what the Haar multipliers are. Uh, in fact, the Haar multipliers are all the bounded uh, collections of, of, of scalars that we can throw as eigenvalues to the, um, to the Haar functions. And in fact, a Haar multiplier, for example, is invertible if and only if all the eigenvalues are bounded away from zero. And the inverse is going to be the Haar multiplier with eigenvalues, uh, the reciprocals of the eigenvalues of T. Uh, so under unconditionality, Haar multipliers in LP are very, very well understood. And they have been understood since it was known that uh, the Haar system in this range is unconditional. So um, let's talk specifically about the Alsbach and Flodel approach towards proving that LP is primary and it involves Haar multiplier. So here's a proposition that I want to slightly um, not slightly briefly talk about, is that every bounded linear operator in one of the separable LP spaces is a projectional factor of a Haar multiplier, S. And in a small parenthesis here, it says up to a small error, so there is some perturbation there, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't affect our, our arguments very much. And I want to quickly say the idea of the proof. The idea of the proof is the following. You want to create a Haar system H I tilde, okay, which is not exactly the Haar system that we define, but it is it is a system that is distributionally equivalent to the Haar system that we define. So every function uh, takes values one and negative one and then zero, and the support is inside uh, where a previous Haar function was either one or negative one. And the way one defines this is by using Rademacher sequences. Uh, so basically, whenever you want to define a new Haar vector, a new Haar function, and you know in what support you want to build it based on what you built before, you have a Radamacher sequence that lives inside the support, and then you pick uh, some uh, Radamacher function of high enough frequency, frequency, and this this is what you call to be the next Haar vector. When and you mean, uh, Paulus, when you mean Haar multiplier, do you mean with respect to some Haar-like system? Or no, no, exactly no, Haar no. Okay. With, re with respect to this, okay. when I say a Haar multiplier, I mean with respect to the original basis. Thank you for this question. And let me, let me, let me speak to that in a little bit. Okay. Um, so this is, this is this natural, very natural process. And if you, if you worked in capital LP spaces, uh, you probably had to do this at some point. Uh, you had to build some system that is isometrically isomorphic to the Haar system. And this is the way you do it. You just build something that is distributionally equivalent by using these Haar vectors. And by using these Radamacher sequences, which are weakly null, you can also achieve this by orthogonality property for your operator T with respect to the system. And this is, this is, this is indeed a very simple process. And this is, uh, this is why I, I'm giving you the, right now the name. This is the canonical projection factorization procedure. And okay, this is very canonical. And if you ever worked in capital LP space and you probably did, you will agree with me. And what do I mean when I say this is a canonical uh, projection factorization procedure. What I mean is that you have this system, HI tilde, which defines a subspace of capital LP, which is isometric to the space. So you find a copy inside the space. So you have this operator A uh, from LP to this subspace, let me call it Y, which is defined by this H tildes. And this is an, this is an isometry. And then you have also a conditional expectation, which is uh, let me not use the parenthesis. It's with respect to an appropriate sigma algebra from um, 
LP2Y, which is a projection. And now using these two operators, you can define a projection factorization of this T as a hard multiplier S. What this hard multiplier S is, it is going to be uh, defined on the whole space capital LP, and it borrows these, these orthogonal values of the operator, these, um, these values that the operator T obtains on this copy of the hard system. So you pull the problem back from a subspace of the space to the whole space. And this is something that people have done, of course. Um, but I'm, I'm giving it now the name canonical projection of factorization procedure. And so there exists this by, by now very often used theorem of Gamlin and Gaudet, which is a little bit older, uh, which doesn't exactly say this, but let me read out loud what I wrote, is that for every Haar multiplier S that is defined on a reflexive LP space, and here, and can, again, the important fact is that the, the system is unconditional not reflexivity. Then either S or the identity minus S is a factor of the identity. Um, and what they actually proved is not exactly this. They proved that if you take your Haar system in a reflexive LP and you break it up into two pieces, two disjoint pieces, uh, and you take the linear spans of the two pieces, then one of them has to be isomorphic to the whole space. So basically what it says, if you take a Haar multiplier that has only eigenvalues zeros and ones, Okay, then either a factor of the identity is the multiplier itself or the identity minus that multiplier because these two multipliers are the projections, the canonical projections on these two subspaces. And so they stated it this way, but their proof is basically saying this. It does, the, the eigenvalues don't have to be just one and zero. They could be basically anything and the, and the, and the method still works. Um, so, so using this, uh, because capital P then is... Um, has the Pelczynski has a, the accordion property of Pelczynski. It is a primary space. And what um, I wanted to, to click forward. So what um, Alsbach, Enfler, and Odell did, they put two and two together, and they observed that uh, if you combine this very canonical method, which which existed before this uh, paper, if you combine this combine this very canonical method with the result of Gamlin and Gaudet, you can get a, a very canonical proof of why LP is primary. Okay, you only have to do this very, very simple, very canonical process, and then you get um, project. Then you get um, you, you reduce your problem to a Haar multiplier. You you truly reduce it. Then you only have to check if your Haar multiplier has this property that either itself or i minus the multiplier is a factor of the identity. And then this follows by this Gamlin and Gaudet construction, which is of course not a trivial thing. Uh, it is a kind of like uh, very delicate uh, measure theoretic construction, but it is um, it is not a very heavy result. It is fairly elementary, uh, but it is quite genius, I would have to say. And so, if you if you if you are very observant, you would have noticed that actually up here somewhere became red. And let me just say that what it says is that the canonical projection factorization procedure it works even in p equals one. Here you don't require reflexivity or conditionality or anything. All you require is that the Radamacha sequence is weakly now. And even in L1, this is true. Um, but gamlin gaudet theorem definitely requires unconditionality. Otherwise, uh, you cannot do the proof. OK, so let me now briefly say a few things about the enfle moray approach, very briefly. Uh, so they, what they essentially proved is that every bounded linear operator on capital LP, where P can be one, is a projectional factor of a multiplication operator. So just a pointwise multiplier, you have a function G and then MG sends every F to G times F. Uh, and this is, the, the, the conclusion is, seems to be very stronger, stronger than having a projectional factor that is a, a hard multiplier, but this, this is a more complicated proof than this very simple argument of uh, Alsbach, uh, Enflo, and, and Odell. And back then, it was considered absolutely necessary to be able to prove uh, primariness of capital one, because back then, people had no idea what to do with higher multipliers on capital one because of conditionality. They didn't know uh, how to invert them or what to do with them. They were a very poorly understood object. Uh, and let me just say, it is truly an exercise that if you have a multiplication function, then either the multiplication function itself or the identity, miles of the, multi the identity minus the multiplication function, which is again a multiplication operator, is a factor of the identity. So just on some set of positive measure, the function is big, and then you just multiply, you factor through there somehow. 
So therefore, L12 is primary. Uh, by this argument, which in the second step is simple, but in the first step, it is actually not that simple. It's, it's some, some deep magical result. Um, OK, so now what I want to do is briefly mention our own approach for capital one, which actually simplified this process. And you don't have to go through, the, through this complicated uh, Enflamore approach of uh, finding you know, a factor, which is uh, a projectional factor, which is, um, which is a pointwise multiplier. Um, so let's start with a bounded harm multipliers on capital one. So let's assume we have one and its eigenvalues are lambda i. I want to look at the Haar system as a tree. So every Haar vector has a port, which is a dyadic interval. This is a, an interval, this is another interval, this is another one. And they form a tree structure. And the tree structure is, is uh, already pretty obvious. And I just drew it. This is the tree. What I will do is I will look at branches of the tree. Um, so I have interval i1, i2, i3, i4, i5, and so on and so forth. They go all the way down to infinity, they run away. And this is a branch on this tree of dyadic intervals. And let me define the following quantity for S. So S is a given Haar multiplier, and it has some given eigenvalues indexed over the dyadic intervals. And this, this value is going to be the supremum over all branches of the L1 variation of the sequence of eigenvalues corresponding to the branch together with the limit. So this is, this is just the, the, the formula for L1 variation. If you look at the dual of uh, the summing basis, this is what you get. And I take this supreme over all branches over the tree. And what actually Semenov and Okusov observed in 2012 is that this quantity is equivalent to the norm of a hard multiplier as a bonded linear operator. Uh, and it is surprising that it was so recently that this very simple and elegant formula, which turns out to be very useful, was observed for capital one. And actually their quantity is not exactly this. It's something equivalent, stated slightly differently. They, instead of a limit, they take a supreme or something like that. Um, and the corollary is, that every Haar multiplier on capital one is a projectional factor of a scalar operator. And I will not give you the technical details of this proof, but it is not difficult at all, actually. This is a very elementary proof that uses only this formula. And what the proof basically says is that because this formula is satisfied, there has to be a very big fat triangle so you have to be able to find a whole such triangle of Haar uh, functions so that in there, my Haar multiplier is constant, basically. So it is so constant that, it, that it, inside there, its distance from a Haar multiplier is as small as you wish. And then inside this big fat triangle, you can construct a complemented copy of capital one that helps you build the projectional factor. And th this just follows if you analyze this formula. This is, this is a very easy proof. Um, it's, and it's truly remarkable that uh, this formula had not been observed before this recently. Okay, so now, um, we can use this to deduce that every bounded linear operator is um, has a projection of has, has a projection factor a Haar multiplier so it's a projection factor of Haar multiplier and this just uses the canonical projection factorization procedure you just take it and then you build a new Haar system and you build a system inside your space that uh, uh, on which t is basically a multiplier and then you pull it back to an operator on the whole space so this is a projection factor and now this operator on the whole space by the formula of Semenov and Uxisov and this very simple argument with the green triangle is a projectional factor of a scalar operator. Therefore, T itself, by transitivity of projectional factors, is a projectional factor of a scalar operator. So I reduced the problem in capital one. I wanted to show that in capital one, every T, either itself or the identity minus T is a, is a, a factor of the identity. We reduced this to a scalar operator. And this is completely easy that if you take a scalar operator, then either itself or the identity minus itself, this is a factor of the identity. This is, uh, if you ever had to work with, with factors of the identity, this is obvious. Therefore, L1 is primary. And we made this observation. Um, well, we didn't formulate it this way because this is not what we were trying to show, but we made this observation in a, in, in a paper that it's a couple of years old, but it appeared uh, in 2020, uh, where this is a paper of um, 
myself, uh, Richard, Paul, and Thomas, uh, in which we were showing properties uh, pertaining to strategical reproducibility of bases, which is very relevant to primarity, at least conceptually. Okay, so I told you about the history, and now I have very few minutes, but it's okay. Now I want to tell you just a few things about uh, the outline of how we prove that capital one of capital case primary. Um, so what is the space capital one of capital P? Uh, it's, it's truly a very simple space. You can see it as a space of uh, Bochner integrable functions, but in this particular scenario, it is just a space of functions defined on the unit square for which this double integral formula is finite. And this is also the norm. So this is truly, I would say by every meaning of the word, a classical space. Um, so of some importance in this space are the following functions. Uh, that you can build. If you take something that is in capital one and you take something that is in capital P, you can define their tensor product, F tensor G. Uh, this is a function capital one of capital P, which is defined by the simple formula. In the first coordinate, in the first, uh, in the first uh, coordinate S, it sees F, and in the second coordinate T, it sees G, and it's the product. So the strategy is the following. Start with the bounded linear operator T from capital one of capital P to capital one of capital P. And the strategy is to consecutively reduce to simpler operators. And when I say consecutively reduce is by finding projectional factors. You projectionally factorize again and again and again to extract operators that are simpler and easier to work with. And at the final step, there will be several steps, several steps, you arrive at an operator S from capital one of capital P which is of the form R tensor I. And what this means is the following. So this final operator S is going to be of the form R tensor I, where R is an operator defined on capital one. And when you act S, this original operator on F tensor G, in reality, it is just this R acting on the L1 side and it leaves the LP side completely alone. You just act on the L1 component. Then once you have done this, you just recall that in capital one, we could show that every operator, either itself or the identity minus the operator is the factor of the identity. So I can say this for this R, this, this component of S, which is actually all that S is. And then for this, I can, I can immediately more or less deduce that the operator S or the identity minus S is a factor of the identity of L1 to LP. And now because I reduced my problem to S, I started with a random T, and then by consecutive projection factorizations, and there are several, I managed to reduce it to this very simple operator for which I was able to show that either itself or the identity minus that is a factor of the identity. Then I can say that capital one of capital P is primary. And this is a strategy. Uh, and I don't know, I have like two more minutes. Um, let me just go through a couple more slides. And- Take your time. I can take my time. All right, so then I will maybe take five or six more minutes. There, there's not that much left. Um, so in order to start, we need to have some sort of understanding of our operators on L1 of LP. And I want to represent every operator as a matrix in a very specific way. I mean, if you have an operator in a space with a basis, it's obviously a matrix, but here I want to do it in a very specific way. So the observation is that if I start with any F in L1 of LP, I can actually decompose it as a sum of such tensors, where on the right side, I have the Haar system in LP. This is in LP, the right side. And on the left side, I have something in L1. So I, I can represent every F in L1 of LP as a, as a, as a, as a vector of, of elements of L1. Okay. And of course, this is not entirely obvious, but this can be done. It is, it is, um, it is something that's very well understood. So every everything in L1 of LP can be represented, think of it as a column of vectors in L1, functions in L1. Then using this representation, every F in L1 of LP is a column of things in L1. So therefore every operator T from L1 of LP can be represented as a matrix of operators from L1 to L1. So this matrix takes, takes takes a, a vector of these Fi's, which is basically an F in L1 of LP, and it transforms it to a new uh, column of things in L1. So, and this is a representation. So everything can be represented as a matrix of operators from L1 to L1. So this is very important because by our previous observation, now we understand better operators from L1 to L1 and what to do with them. And 
given such a representation of an operator from L1 for P to 1 for P, I will say that it is diagonal if this representation as a matrix is a diagonal matrix, namely the off diagonal entries are going to be zero. Um, so in this case, we may, for example, observe that uh, I don't need a double sum to represent T. I just need a single sum. And what T does on an F, it just transforms all of its entries uh, by a single operator and it doesn't send one entry to another or anything like that. It just acts diagonally. Um, and our theorem can be broken up into two main steps. The first step is you start with an arbitrary operator on L1 of LP, and then you reduce it to a, to a diagonal operator. So it, your, your arbitrary operator is a projection factor of a diagonal operator in the, in the sense that we just mentioned, up to some small error. And the idea of the proof is the following. First, manually, by hand, so you, you just write it out, you write T0 as a projection factor of an operator that is not diagonal, a T1 tilde, but the entries that swap between coordinates are all Haar multipliers. So they are Haar multipliers. This is something that is not very difficult to do manually. Well, when I say not very difficult, I mean comparatively to the rest. And then in the second property, you use compactness properties of families of Haar multipliers to eliminate all of diagonal entries. And compactness properties of families of Haar multipliers is one of the tools we had to develop for this paper, for example. Um, and then once you have a Haar multiplier. Uh, so maybe there is a thing I should say here before going to the next slide. This is kind of important. So Capon, when I said that uh, one of her papers uh, is uh, very sophisticated and it involves many tools and it is based on the Enflamore approach, she also does this. She takes an operator and she reduces it to some sort of diagonal operator when you go to capital one of X for X with symmetric basis. But because she uses the Enflamore approach, she doesn't have hard multipliers. She has pointwise multipliers. Uh, so although we do something similar, the approach is very different. Uh, we prove it differently. So time to go to the next slide. So now we have a projection factor at hand. Excuse me. We have a diagonal operator at hand. We reduced our problem to a diagonal operator. And now we want to show that this is either itself or the identity minus itself is a factor of the identity. We cannot do it, not directly. But what we can do is the following. We can write it as a projection factor of another diagonal operator, T2, with the following extremely strong diagonal with the extreme, following extremely strong stability property. If you look at the entries of this operator, this diagonal operator, so it's diagonal entries, they're all extremely close to each other. So if I take two dyadic intervals, I and J, and I lives inside J, then TI is epsilon close to the J, where epsilon J is pre-chosen. I can have pre-chosen it to be whatever I want, some small number. That's uh, T2, that's T2 and the... Uh... Ah, yes, T2, that's T2, thank you, of course. It's the second operator. And this can be done. Uh, this is not obvious at all how you do this, but what this means is you have your tree and then you have your TIs indexed over the tree. And then I take a TJ here and then everything under this guy, all the TIs in here are epsilon J close to this guy. And the idea of the proof is the following. Very, very brief. This is, this is, this is, a, this is a long proof and it, it, it requires, uh, this requires some work. And this is also why it has a few nice tools that we, that we came up for it. First of all, you have to use a concentration of measure argument uh, to deduce that T1 can be reduced to another diagonal operator, T2 tilde, that doesn't have this stability property, but its entries all of its entries are uniformly eventually close to Haar multipliers. And I won't tell you exactly what this means, but what it means is that if you look at the tails of these operators, they get closer and closer to being Haar multipliers, and this happens in a uniform manner. And this is the most delicate part of the whole paper. So it involves a random choice of operators. Uh, and these uh, these random operators with high probability satisfy certain stability properties. Not the stability property up here, but another one uh, that you have to, to, be, to, to, to do to be able to achieve this. Then once you achieve this, which is a lot of work, in the second step, you have to deduce, you can deduce, I'm lying a little bit here, but more or less this is what you deduce, that you can again go to a new operator so reduced to an even simpler operator where the entries of this operator 
are relatively compact in the operator norm topology. And of course, this does mean the operators themselves are compact. The operators are not compact by any means, but the set of operators, all these entries, the TIs, it's a compact set, a relatively compact set. Okay. And once you have this relatively compact set of operators, you repeat your concentration of measure argument to be able to bundle them together by taking random choices so that you have this very strong stability property. And then once you did this, you're more or less done. Then if you take an operator that satisfies this, this very, very strong stability property here, then under this assumption, so this is your operator T2, which I, I didn't rewrite the property, then there exists some R from L1 to L1, so that T is very close to an operator of this form that only acts on the first coordinate, only the L1 coordinate and forgets the rest. And then, okay, there's a small error, and there was a small error in other steps too, but we are able to account for this. Therefore, in the end, up to this small error, T0 is a projectional factor of this operator here. And as I explained a couple of slides earlier, this means we are done. So we can show that this is a factor of the identity, or I minus this is a factor of the identity. Um, and this is all I had to say with regards to the proof. Of course, many details were hidden, uh, but there are a few questions and maybe I can just leave it open and say, I can end the lecture here and just, you know, we can talk about them if you ask me the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paulus. That was amazing. Um, all right, so probably there are a lot of questions so we can open for them. Yes, uh, not a question, just a small historical remark. The primariness of CK, which is your CK where K is countable, was proved by uh, Alsbach and myself independently of the proof of, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. I will, I will take that into consideration. And if I give this lecture again, I will make sure to include it. Thank you. Uh, and we also, we also then, these are, these are, these are uh, uh, spaces of uh, ordinals, and we also discuss the case of uh, uncountable. Ordinals. Right, right. Oh. Now that you mention it, I remember, yes. <laughs> well, now, well, one question which is uh, very natural, maybe a little bit too optimistic, but it's impossible not to ask it somehow. Uh, do you have any new information on the very famous problem to know whether a complemented subspace of capital L1 is isomorphic to capital L1 or little L1. I understand that the nature is different because you have one space and not one of two spaces in the decomposition, but you are using very deep stuff. So there is hope that you have some more light on this business. You are right. This is a very, very natural question to ask, and we are asking ourselves the same question. So we are wondering, do the tools that we developed give any information in that direction? We haven't been able to do anything, but uh, it would be very nice. I, I, it would be too optimistic to say, but uh, it's probably worth looking into, and we are. And okay. yeah, we'll see. Sure. Is being a projectional factor an equivalence relation? Uh, I mean, if you are a projectional, no, no, because uh, it is not reflexive, is it? I don't think so. I mean, what's the property? If you are a projection of T is a projectional factor of S, it does not mean that S is a projectional factor of T, does it? If it is, I don't know. I didn't think about this. But Pavlos, you introduced a new property on the last slide. What's yes. What's going on there? Okay, so this is not a new property, but uh, so since we're talking about open problems, the second one talks about the factorization property. And this is all relevant to this stuff because let me tell you if uh, uh, me and my co-authors hadn't been working on the factorization property, we would have never proved this result. So the factorization property is, the, is for spaces with bases. So a space, X with a basis EN, so it comes together with a basis, is said to have the factorization property. If every bounded linear operator on it, which is large on the diagonal, so it's diagonal entries when it's represented as a metric are bounded away from zero. If you assume that every such operator is a factor of the identity, then we say that um, the, the space X with this basis, 
it comes with a basis has the factorization property. And uh, some spaces known to have the factorization property are, for example, LP in the reflexive range or in the unconditional range more appropriately uh, by Andrew in 79, uh, LP of LQ in the reflexive range by Laus and Lechner and Müller. And, uh, and in this recent paper that I mentioned in which we observed these properties of this, uh, um, how one can work with uh, multipliers on capital one. We also observe that capital one has this factorization property. And the question is, does this space, capital one of capital P have the factorization property? And our proof does not directly give this. It is not beyond uh, reason to think that some modification would make it work, but if it does, it's not obvious. So this is why I'm posing this question. And since I'm posing the questions now, another couple of questions related to primariness. There are many more spaces for which primariness is open, classical spaces, but the, the ones that are more relevant to this method are capital P of capital one. So you switch the order. And let me say that in our proof, in several points, we use the fact that capital one of X is a projective tensor product. But I, I, it is probably not entirely necessary. Maybe you can circumvent some of these things. So it is not beyond reason to think that similar methods could work if you reverse the order. And you just make sure that you avoid anything that has to do with projective tensor products. And also L1 of C of K for K, a compact metric space, because these spaces, they look like well-founded trees. So um, it is possible that things there may work. The one that I don't know at this point, I don't know at least, uh, is if you do L1 of C01, this one seems to be difficult to achieve with this method. There would have to be some, some pretty strong improvement of it to show L1 of C01. Pablos, yeah. uh, I would suggest a, a change of languages. What you call, uh, you say that T is a factor of S. It's a little bit confusion, confusing. The, mm -hmm. the classical language is S factors through T. Yes. Uh, and then you could say S projectionally factors through T. And that would yes. not be confusing. Yes, we use both actually in the paper. But uh, I, I decided to stick with one of the two. And... I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you're right. Though I guess we can discuss it among the co-authors. Yeah. Well, T is a factor of S could equally well be understood as T factors through S. It, it's, it's not very good language. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when you write it down, it kind of makes sense. Like you know, S is written as A T B, so T is one of the three factors, right? But if it is confusing, then maybe we should uh, take into consideration this fact and try to make it as little confusing as possible because it's the last thing we want to get people confused on these facts. <laughs> <The language. laughs> yes. can, you, can you go back to that, uh, that three picture you had where um, that you define a new norm? Uh, using the eigenvalues. What exactly was the result again? <laughs> Oh, I mean, the result here, I mean, the, what we're saying, so what we're, okay, so first of all, there exists this formula, right? And then using this formula, then you can simply deduce that these, these eigenvalues, they stabilize very strongly on a fat subtree. And when I say stabilize, not only the values are epsilon close to each other, but the operator they define is close to an identity operator on there. So you said you can, uh, you can find a complemented subspace in that. Uh, so in there, yes. I mean, even if, yes, even if you even if you don't care about isometric results, if you just take the Haar system inside this tree, just the functions that live inside this tree, they define a subspace isomorphic to one and complement it in another one. So you can use this to build the projection factorization. Yeah. Oh yeah. So do you have the full? triangle there or you have some the full triangle the full triangle this formula here tells you this is something that i forget to forgot to say and this is very important actually that, that in capital one being a uh, multiplier it may seem as a disadvantage because you don't know how to invert it you don't know what to do it but once you understand this formula being a hard multiplier is an extremely rigid thing it basically tells you that the values have to be modulo breaking up into finite parts, they have to be the same more or less. This, this, this variation here, it tells you that things have to be extremely close to each other. So in capital one, the Haar multipliers are a very, very rigid object that 
turn out to be an extreme advantage towards proving things. You can circumvent the gambling Gaudet process. You don't even need it. All you need is this fact that on triangles, your operators are basically the identity. Is a proof of this uh, of, of this equivalence how? This, Excuse this me. Can you can, can you repeat the, the question? I didn't hear the first part. Is a is a proof of this theorem of Semyonov and of Sostov? The proof is uh, the proof is. Uh, uh, the, the, I, I, I have to tell you, I never look at their proof. We, we have written a proof in our paper for the yeah, safe, for safe containment. But uh, I mean, I can quickly tell you what the proof is. If you, if you understand capital one, which I'm sure you do, you will agree with me that this is a proof. First thing one observes is that the branches on capital one, the branches of Haar functions form the different, sp the different spaces of little one. Sure. And then on the difference basis of little one, diagonal operators have the same formula as the difference basis. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. And then if you take any operator on capital one, because the levels uh, on the levels, you have the, 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 the intervals on the levels, the, the, their convex hull is the whole space, uh, is dense in the set, then the norm is achieved on taking intervals, right. and so then the simple. intervals, there's this hard formula that tells you that that interval is written specifically as a combination of its predecessors. Of and this is, this is the proof. Right. Yeah. yeah, actually it was told by, us, by Maria. Maria Girardi told us, gave us the reference mm -hmm. after we proved it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much, Paulus. Thank you.